and welcome. This is The News. I'm your host, Keith Lander. Uh, thank you for viewing. Hey, if you go to the Facebook page, like the Facebook page, and subscribe, then uh, you won't miss a thing. Uh, this is New Year, so hopefully all of you have a new year. I hope you set some resolutions and uh, stick to them. <laughs> so uh, I don't set resolutions because I probably won't stick to them. And so uh, to get on with the show, uh, we like to start today with a uh, survey that was done by uh, PolitiFact, which is a website that's uh, non-biased, and uh, they report actual facts on uh, political stories, stories in the news, which is one of my go-to websites, PolitiFact. You know, you want, might want to check that out. And uh, PolitiFact had a lie of the year for reader's choice, and uh, they had several um, statements made by certain politicians, and um, the person who won the lie of the year for 2021 was Donald Trump. And the lie was, he stated that uh, they had won the election, they had won it by a landslide, and they won by a landslide. Slide. And that, of course, won the lie of the year. And, of course, he went on to say, uh, Donald Trump, that uh, Joe Biden, President Biden, didn't win Arizona. He says he lost Arizona based on a forensic uh, audit. That was a lie, big-time lie. And also, he said in 2020, they, he said he won Wisconsin. Uh, he claims Georgia didn't update their voter rolls prior to the 2020 election. Uh, and this means you, which whoever you are, uh, won the presidential election in Georgia, which was all a lie according to PolitiFact and according to the facts of this election. But you know the sad thing is about what Donald Trump was saying, and we all know it was a lie, and the people who voted for him realized that he lost, that it was uh, elected officials who basically, after several audits and 60 lawsuits, and many challenges to the election. It was all baseless and was all thrown out of court. Uh, some of these courts that Donald Trump went into to prove that he claimed there was this fraud and that he won, uh, I think it was maybe eight of uh, appointed judges by Donald Trump who said that the case had no merit. And so the bottom line is that the election was done fair. They were done uh, the most secure, according to the people who handled this election. And yet Donald Trump still went out and started saying that he won and there was some kind of steal. And every, some folks in the Republican Party <coughs> excuse, took this lie and ran with it. And they tried to sow the seed of doubt that the election wasn't fair, but the election was fair. Because I can tell you how it was fair, just one way. Some of those people who was complaining that the election wasn't fair, they were on the same ballot that Donald Trump was on, and yet they won. So how is it that they can win on the same ballot, went through the same machine, and yet theirs, they come out and they won, but Donald Trump lost? So this game they're playing, this was the biggest lie ever told in 2021. So Donald Trump has not only been impeached twice, but he also been voted for the lie of the year. And he keeps saying that lie, and some people believe it. You know, if you got an ounce of common sense, you know the man didn't win. So... We're going to move on from that lie, and we won't bring up that man's name anymore because it's not worth it. Uh, here in Montgomery County, Ohio, uh, Montgomery County, starting January the 1st, resident in Montgomery County, Ohio, that is, has a new hotline to call for help for mental health and substance abuse. It's called Crisis Now. They will answer um, calls to a new, newly created hotline number 24 hours, 7 days a week. And that number is 833 uh, five eight uh, zero. So I, I give it to you again. The number is uh, eight three three five eight two two five five. So if if you have some issues with uh, mental health or substance abuse and uh, you need some help in twenty four hours, uh, as Helen Jones Kelly stated to the Dayton Daily News, Helen Jones Kelly is the um, the CEO of Montgomery County Alcohol Drug and addiction and mental health services. Uh, she stated that the need for emergency mental health services in Montgomery County is great. And uh, she said in Montgomery County, in three years, the call and suicide prevention hotlines are up 30%. And so, um, you know, in 10 other states has the same kind of hotline. So it seems to be working. 
So if you know anybody who who's needs some mental counseling or substance abuse, call this number, 833-58-2255. And that's a, a good thing. That's in Montgomery County. The city of Trotwood, Ohio. The city of Trotwood, I, I uh, spoke on this and reported this uh, last year. It's a new developmental uh, housing for uh, seniors, affordable housing, that is. Um, a plan for senior living development here is uh, tentatively set to be completed by 2023. Uh, the proposed Trotwood Senior Lofts will be located at 702 East Main Street and will contain 50 units. Uh, the project is headed by the Miami Valley Affordable Housing Partners, LLC, and it aims to appeal to seniors who are 55 years or older and will rent to those in the area with the medium income as low as 30%. So Trotwood, the, the affordable senior housing, will be up and running by 2023. And it's an excellent um, design. I, I've seen it online. It looks real nice. And uh, my hat goes off to the people in Trotwood, Ohio, uh, especially the, the mayor and the uh, city staff for working hard and bringing this to fruition. And we can never have uh, too many homes, especially affordable housing, that is. So um, on to the next story. You remember there was a lot of protest after uh, George Floyd um, uh, killing or assassination that we've seen. Uh, and all these protests, and people say, well, what, what, what are these protests? Are they working? Are we getting anything out of these protests? Well, here's, um, it says, the proof is in the pudding. It says, protests reduce police killings according to new research. Now, this research was done by a Stanford University uh, psycholo uh, sociologist, Susan Orzo, Orzo is her name. And here's the results of, some of the results of her study. It says the results were clear, at least where the issues were local. Many, uh, my study of Americans' 170 largest cities between uh, the years 2000 and 2019 found that street protests were followed by decline in officer-involved fatalities of black and Latino individuals. And then it also says that um, it also says that uh, the black and Latino fatalities uh, were reduced by 11% and the Latino fatalities were reduced by 7% where these, where these protests took place. The study goes on also to say that body cameras also has and that effect to reduce the, um, uh, the results of fatalities in uh, black communities and Latino communities. So for all the protests and the marching, folks you were heard, uh, it's effective, it works, and uh, you know, continue doing what you're doing for all those people out there who's marching for justice and equality. And see, this is why uh, Governor of uh, Florida, that Ron DeSantos, who called the, um, the protest mob activities. You know what? I wonder what Ron DeSantos would call those thugs who beat up police officers at the Capitol January 6th. What do we call those people? I bet he called those people friends. So we know where he's headed. This guy's racist. See, we got to call this stuff out when we see it. You know what I mean? Ron DeSantos is racist just by making that remark. And I don't care if anybody like it or not. We got to call it what it is. Without calling it what it is, you know, we'd never get to the root of it to root it out. You know, I see all these talking heads on TV. They want to over-intellectualize things. Call it what it is. <laughs> call it what it is. And let the chips lay where they lie. So I'm, I'm going to move on before I get... Uh, wound up. Um, here's a judge, <laughs> and I, I think we got a clip of this judge. This is, this is um, the headline reads, judge wants forgiveness and understanding after she's caught on video calling suspect the N-word. Well, what happened is in uh, Lafayette County City Judge and her family were victims of a burglary at their home. Uh, somebody tried to break into their uh, cars. Uh, now, days later, Judge Michelle Ordnett and her four children were captured in a cell phone video watching the security footage of the moment the suspect, Berkeley, was apprehended. And boy, oh boy, this is what they said, folks. And I think we got a, a video of it, and you can hear the sound. I think we'll roll that, and then I'll repeat it on the other side. 
was yelling. And so, as as you heard, he, they said uh, we have an in. It's an in, like a roach. A female voice could be heard saying. And so, um, <laughs> one and on the voice you hear, look at mom. Mom called her an in, like a roach. You know what the N word is, like a roach. Now, why is this important? Because this lady is a judge. She has power over folks. And if she views black folks as ends and roaches standing before her in her court, how can justice be blind when her mind is already made up? Now, here's, here's, a, here's the catch. There was an outcry, and people wanted her to be removed from the bench. And she first got suspended, and then after that, she went ahead and resigned. You see, so your voice is heard when you speak up for what's right. And this woman in this position, using the kind of language she used against this car burglar, was wrong. And she should have no power over anybody. If she was just a regular old person on the streets, eh, so what? But this woman has power. She can lock people up, put them in jail for a long time. And she was, her views from what she called this man for trying to break in the car was racist. And we don't need more races on the bench. We got enough of them already. This one here, she just exposed herself. A lot of them hadn't been exposed yet, but we know through their, how they sentence black folks, we know it ain't right. And the only thing he could be left to offer is why is the race of individuals. So I'm glad this judge is gone, and hopefully we can get some more. So on to the next story. Uh, black couple, whitewashed home, acts white friend to pose as an owner after biased lowball appraisal. Now listen to this story, folks. A black couple in Northern California, they're suing this appraisal company for getting a lowball price. And this is how they found out it was lowball. Uh, they bought their four-room bedroom house in, uh, in a neighborhood in San Francisco Bay Area in 2016 for $550,000. Paul Austin, who is 45, and his wife, Tanisha Tate Austin, who is 42, uh, made nearly $400,000 worth of renovations. Okay, now, what happened was they had an appraisal. And this appraisal came in, and he basically appraised the house for $995,000. Well, they didn't agree with that, and so what, what they did, the Austins did, they got one of their white friends, and their white friends came in, they, no, no, before the white friend came in, the Austins took out all their pictures, all their African art, and they, and they got their white friend to come into the house and pretend that the house was hers and get another appraisal. Well, the other appraisal showed up. He thought the white woman owned the house, and he appraised the house for one and a half million dollars. The other appraisal wasn't even close. And they're suing this appraisal company, and rightfully so, because sometimes when we get, black folks get a low overall appraisal, and the house is valued at a heck of a lot more. And this is proof. And matter of fact, there's a study that was done to support how black folks are being treated when it comes to appraisal. And um, the studies have found that homes in neighborhoods where there's a higher population of black people are valued at about half the price of the neighborhoods with no black, according to the Booking Institute. So if you want to look that up, you can look up the Booking Institute's uh, study and uh, what they found. And that's a shame, folks. You know, people say, well, how, how do you deal with, with racism and how, how, how you get it to uh, get it reduced? I can tell you how you get it reduced. There's laws on the books that, that should prevent people from being treated and being discriminated against. You enact those laws, like the judge, all right? When folks find about this judge and the language he used against that black uh, suspect for trying to break in their car, they fired him. That's what should happen. This company that dealing that low ball, this uh, black couple, this company should be sued to the maximum of the law. You see, you got to understand some folks. Back when white folks didn't want to serve people of color in these uh, restaurants and hotels and all this kind of thing, well, what happened? The law changed, and the law said you will, or you'll be hit for violating the law. The folks' attitude didn't change. The law changed. And so when you 
have a law on the books and it's supposedly for preventing discrimination and you have a case of it, then you throw the book at these people. See, because you're not going to change their mind. If they're going to be racist, they're going to be racist all their life. They, they'll probably die racist. But if you don't allow them to enact their racism and put it upon and target black folk or people of color, and if you find out that that's what they did after you go into a court of law or you see evidence that they did, you throw the book at them. That'll stop it. Like I said before, how do you stop and reduce police from killing black folks? You march them in that courtroom like Derek Chavis, and he have his day in court, and if he can't prove his innocence, and he didn't, go to jail. Same way with the other woman who shot the individual come t talking about she had a taser. I got taser, taser. She shot the man, killed him. She's going to jail. You start sending these people to jail for violating black folks' civil rights and human rights, then they'll take notice, right? They will take notice because they don't want to go to jail. They will take notice. I can tell you that. That's how you reduce it. So let me move on. Uh, one year later, uh, President Biden has confirmed more lifetime judges than decades of presidents. You probably won't hear that over the news uh, media. President uh, Joe Biden is winding down his first year in office, already having made significant headways in the most uh, lasting legacies as far as judicial confirmation. Now, check this out, folks. Biden has confirmed 40 lifetime federal judges this year. That breaks down to 11 appeal court judges and 29 district court judges. Uh, by context, Donald Trump only confirmed 18 appeals court uh, justices in his first year's office. Uh, President Obama had only confirmed 12, and President George W. Bush had only confirmed 28. President Bill Clinton, Clinton only confirmed 27. And so uh, Joe Biden is uh, basically tied with Ronald Reagan of, uh, of 40 lifetime appointments. And it breaks down uh, to this here. Uh, 32 are women, 27 are uh, people of color, and 21 are women of color, and 27 has a professional diverse background, uh, and 14 are, are former public defenders. Now, we have to keep this up, y'all, to get these people appointed, and that means that we, the Democrats, have to basically control Senate and the House. That's the only way we're going to get these people appointed, because Mitch McConnell and the rest of the Republican Party in office right now, they've already checked out. They ain't going to do jack. The only thing they're going to do is kiss Donald Trump's behind. That's all they're doing. They don't care what kind of harm it does to the, the, their constituents. And Mitch McConnell in Kentucky, Kentucky is, is number one in the poor states in the country, number one for food stamps, education systems falling apart, and Mitch McConnell is kissing Donald Trump's behind, and Donald Trump can care less. He can care less about poor people. Matter of fact, he can care less about the folks who were in jail for uh, trying to go to and, and storm the Capitol. Like I said before, Donald Trump ain't paid not one of y'all bill. And y'all went there and acted a fool, got yourself thrown in jail, got yourself fired, and Donald Trump ain't even said nothing about you. Who's the fool? And y'all still support this clown. Let me move on. I, <laughs> it's a new year. Ain't no sense of getting wound up <laughs> on the first show. I got a lot more shows to do. <laughs> so... Um, let me, let me bring this up, folks. Um, Jesse Waters, if you don't know who he is, he's a uh, personality on uh, Fox News. And this guy, Jesse Waters, he was at an um, event held by a conservative think tank. And here's what he said, folks. For the kill shot. The kill shot with an ambush, deadly. Because he doesn't see it coming. This is when you say... Dr. Fauci, you funded risky research at a sloppy Chinese lab, the same lab that sprung this pandemic on the world. You know why people don't trust you, don't you? Boom! He is dead. He is dead. He's done. Now, how you do that in 30 seconds. That's all you need. 30 seconds. Now you get that footage to us, you get it to Fox, you get it to Human Events, you get it to Breitbart, you get it to Daily Caller, you get it to the Turning Point Pipeline. Imagine Tucker Carlson teases out of the A block, coming up. 
Jesse Walters just put a hit out on Anthony, Dr. Anthony Fauci to kill him. This guy is on Fox News every day. Even Fox News knew about this, but they did nothing to discipline Jesse Walters for saying he wants somebody to kill Dr. Fauci. This is Fox News. Some of y'all look at this garbage. This is what we're dealing with, folks. Dr. Fauci has said that folks have been calling his house, harassing him, harassing his family, harassing his kids. It's because of rhetoric like this. This is serious, folks. This man don't deserve this. Any, any responsible journalist will not say that you put a hit on somebody just because you disagree with them. Come on, y'all, we can do better than this. Where is the FCC? Somebody needs to stand in and say, Jesse Walters do not belong on television, ever. Come on, folks. We can difference on opinion, but I don't have to difference of opinion to you to, to have somebody or suggest somebody kill you and assassinate you and then videotape it and then send it to the conservative news outlets like Jesse Walters just implied. So, I ain't done yet. Uh, Representative Debbie Dingle, who's the 12th district uh, for Michigan, man, she, had, she gets phone calls. And one of the phone calls, I think, we gotta, I think we can play that clip, I believe. I'm going to let you listen to the phone call, uh, this clip, and I'll respond on, on the other side. Old denial. You're, you're as old and ugly as Biden. You ought to get the off the planet. You foul. I hope your family dies in front of you. I pray to God if you've got any children, they die in your face. So, you heard the, you heard the phone call, right? This man has, this guy is crazy. These are the kind of calls that people are getting, the representative Congress folks are getting on an everyday basis. Representative Dingo says she's been getting these phone calls for over a year. She said this on CNN. All of this stuff started. All of this hate. And that's a lot of hate that that caller had for Debbie Dingo. And don't even know Debbie Dingo. This guy said he hopes her family dies in front of her. That's a lot of hate. That's a whole lot of hate. You know what I mean? He don't even know the woman. He can't even spout off one piece of legislation that the woman has sponsored. But he's listening to these talking heads on these cable shows who spit out this rhetoric and make money off this rhetoric, and they wound people up to the point where they storm the Capitol, knock the doors down, champ, they want to kill Mike Pence, and this kind of nonsense. And all those Republican representatives in Congress that day supported that nonsense. This is where we are, folks. This is why we got to be careful about who we send to Washington, who we send to the State House, who we send to the local, um, uh, your local representatives. We have to be careful of this stuff. Having a grievance with the other side, how does that help lower your prescription drug prices? How did that help lower your, your health care coverage? How did that help with your mortgage? How did that help put, put food on the table? How did that help get you a job? Huh? How did that help lower the inflation? Just hollering and screaming at the other side don't help. These people hollering and screaming at the other side has no plan to help you and me and anybody else around here. They just want to make noise and sow division. And some people is gullible enough to latch on to this nonsense. I'll give you an example. People out here, y'all got most of these people hollering and screaming about socialism, and they own Social Security. They own Medicaid, government sponsored. But they saying, we don't want the government in our health care. If it wasn't for the government in your health care, you'd probably be dead by now by high blood pressure and diabetes and some other stuff. Huh? All right. I told you it's going to <laughs> Ah, move on. <laughs> Before I start sweating up here. I want to say something about this democracy. You know, we hear that term a lot. And there are some principles of democracy. And with the 
we hear from folks saying we're trying to save this country's democracy. Well, let me give you the seven principles. Well, actually, there's 13 principles of democracy. And there's citizens, <clears throat> citizens participation, equality, political tolerance, accountability, transparency, regular and free and fair elections, economic freedom, control of the abuse of power, the Bill of Rights, accepting the results of the election. Let me say that one again. Accepting the results of the election, human rights, multi-party system, and the rule of law. Now, I just want to touch on just a couple of these things. Uh, uh, basically, political tolerance. It says, if the majority deny the rights to destroy their opposition, then they also destroy democracy. What we have here, we got the minority trying to uh, oppose and, and the rights of the majority. And that destroys democracy. That's why the Voting Rights Act, John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and For the People's Act is the most important piece of legislation of our time. Because if those two bills are not passed, then these states keep these voter suppression laws in place. And some of these states has it where if they disagree with the election or the outcome of the election, they come in with this flimsy audit done by people they chose, which means they're going to fabricate the results of the election to flip it so that their candidate comes out to be the winner, although the people didn't vote for him. That's what's on the books in some of these states right now. If you don't believe me, you look it up. That's why we have to do everything we can to get this John Lewis Voting Rights Act passed and For the People's Act passed. Because the way this thing was set up, the Supreme Court gutted the Civil Rights, Civil Rights Act. And they took out the part where these states had to uh, basically tell the federal government how they were changing the voting rights system in their states because there was discrimination going in back then. Supreme Court took that out, which paved the way for these states to do anything they wanted to do with voting rights. And that's what we see today. So we have to hold these people accountable because if not, we won't have a democracy. All that crap about these people talking about Trump, talking about oh, if, if you don't fight for your country, you won't have a country. Uh, you're going to have a country. We had Republican presidents before. The country still survived. We had Democratic presidents before. The country still survived. We had control of Congress by Republicans. The country survived. We had control by Democrats. The country survived. So what the heck he's talking about? This country will survive. But we won't survive if, in fact, that the elections are not fit free, the next elections are not fair, and these people put up obstacles so that they can prevent people from voting. I'll give you another example. I believe it's in Kentucky again. No, it's in Georgia. In Georgia, there was 111 voting boxes where you can drop your stuff in the voting box, right? They reduced that down to, I think it was 39 now. Huh? And you're going to tell me they ain't trying to suppress your vote? Come on, folks. Um, I'll give you another. I just want to hit on one more. Um, free and fair elections. It says obstacles should not exist to make it difficult for people to vote. This is the principles of democracy, folks. If we don't hold this together, then we're looking at a either dictatorship, autocrat, or whatever it is, because the people's vote will not count. We're coming up on Dr. King's celebration of his birthday, right? And we're talking about the same thing now that Dr. King talked about in the 60s. The same thing. That's what we're talking about now, voting rights. And these people now, the ones who are on the other side trying to prevent people from, from, from voting, they done got slick. They didn't get evilly wicked with it. And they're trying to put people in power that will go along with it. We just seen a coup attempt on January the 6th. And now folks don't even want to get to the answers, get to the bottom of who's responsible for sending these people to Washington and acting a fool and trying to do a coup attempt. 
They're trying to do a coup attempt. And some Republicans don't even want the investigation to be done. That's part of democracy, folks. Investigations, accountability. Without that, you don't have a democracy. So the next time you hear one of these talking heads talking about, oh, we don't, we don't need this investigation, this investigation is a farce, well, prove it. Prove it's a farce. You have no proof because you know the people who saying it was a farce on January 6th are the people involved in the coup attempt. And that's been proven. Peter Navarro, which was Trump's economic advisor, or whichever he was, he's some, some clown in, in, the cabinet, in, in his cabinet, stated on national TV that they wanted, when he's he talking about they, he's talking about Trump, him, and the rest of his henchmen, wanted to overthrow the elections in Georgia, Pennsylvania, and I forget the other state. They wanted to overthrow the people's vote and say that their vote didn't count. And they wanted Mike Pence to go along with it. And then Mike Pence finally had some sense and, and went ahead and certified the election. If Mike Pence hadn't certified that election, folks, they would have overturned this thing. So I give Mike Pence a little credit, not much, because he kissed Trump behind, too. But he did the right thing when it comes to certifying this election, and that's what held, and that's what held up democracy. Without that John Lewis Voting Rights Bill passed, and without that For the People's Act, if those two pieces of legislation don't pass, we won't have a democracy. We won't have it, folks. I'm telling you. So the bottom line is, we got to vote. We got to make sure that President Biden, we got to make sure that this thing about this filibuster, let me say this, and I'm going to close. People talking about, oh, you shouldn't, especially Joe Manchin in Virginia. Them folks down there, they so poor, it's a shame. And Joe Manchin up there talking about he don't want no, uh, no monies and no aid for that state. He, he done lost his mind. Joe Manchin is in the way. Christine Sinema, she was in the way. Joe Manchin is in the way of passing this voting rights uh, uh, bill, folks. All because he don't want to get rid of the filibuster. Let me tell you something about Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell been in, been in Congress as long as I've been alive. If Mitch McConnell see that he can get a victory in, in redoing the filibuster or redoing whichever, Mitch McConnell go right ahead and do it, and he gets support of it. He don't care about no, no tradition. What the heck are we talking about some kind of tradition, and we got the most important piece of legislation on the table right now, and Joe Manchin talking about we don't want to get rid of the filibuster. Mitch McConnell would have got rid of the filibuster as, uh, as soon as, uh, if Donald Trump would have won, as soon as he, he got sworn in, he'd have got rid of the filibuster. So we better wake up. We better be smart, folks. We got to be smart. Just don't play this game. Joe Manchin's phone calls, they should be flooded with calls. Asking him why. Why are you holding up the most important piece of legislation that is tied to democracy in this country? If that piece of legislation is not Pass, folks. Your vote, as they say, it will not count because these people are doing everything they can so that it won't count. And we got to stop. It. We have to stop it, folks. We got to do it legislatively. I'm not advocating like Jesse Waters going out shooting folks in violence. That's stupid. But we got to vote and we got to hold those accountable. We got to call our representatives, wherever your representative is, call them. Tell them to support it, you know? Tell them to support it, whoever your representative is. So, oh, let me, <laughs> let me do this. And I don't care if folks don't like it or not. I'm going to say it anyway. That John Lewis Voting Rights Bill and For the People's Act, well, it, it passed in the House. It's in the Senate now, and Joe Manchin is acting a fool. But let me tell you somebody who voted against it. I believe it was Mike Turner. Yes. The same Mike Turner you see with the Dayton chapter of the NAACP chumming up with the Dayton chapter of the NAACP president, Derek Forward, smiling, taking pictures. I got a message for Mike Turner. Why do you want to vote against a piece of legislation like this? And you chumming up to the oldest civil rights organization in this land, the NAACP. Huh? See... <laughs> We got to hold those accountable, even if they are so-called friends. We got to hold them accountable, folks. We got to. We can't let these people play us for stupid. We can't let these people vote against the most important civil rights piece of legislation and then go over to 
one of our oldest civil rights organizations in this land and chum me up with him, and he's voting every against, against everything the NAACP stands for. We got to call him out. We have to call him out. If not, who's the fool? I'm, I'm going to close with that before I get in trouble. <laughs> I done said enough already. So until next time, may God bless you and your family.